It has 148 pages in total, and when you look at it, it's really an all-color story. It is the original story of Nausicaa and pretty much the origin of all Miyazaki's other works. The Blue Arrow, 1.2.3.4.5 that flows is the path of Shuna, the path traveled by the main character, a prince named Shuna. So, actually, Shuna's journey is a story after Laputa crashed, and it is a story about the period connecting Laputa and Nausicaa. We have been in the so-called Miyazaki Week or Ghibli Week since last week, with the limited release of the Laputa commentary and the redistribution of the manga version of Nausicaa, and this is another video about Miyazaki's works. It's not so well known to the public. It is a work that has not been animated at all. It is called Shuna's Journey. It's a paperback. Hao Miyazaki did all the illustrations in color and drew the story. Here are the picture stories. Good evening, this is Toshio Okada's seminar. This work called Shuna's Journey is very little known compared to other Ghibli anime, but it is the first original work that Hao Miyazaki published, so it is really the origin story, which contains a lot of so-called original stories and essence that lead to all his other works. People who talk about Hao Miyazaki and people who do research. I think that it is a work that cannot be removed. As I have said many times in this seminar, Hao Miyazaki is particular about his lines and words. First and foremost, he is an artist who speaks through images, an artist who speaks through paintings. So too, is this Shuna's journey. All written by the person who wrote it with more attention to detail than the written text, in pencil from the beginning. It's a painting finished with watercolors. So it is a little difficult to understand the extraordinary worldview and themes behind the story unless you look at the illustrations and decipher them. In this video, page by page of this Shuna's journey, it is a detailed explanation of the journey of the Shuna, including the parts that are often overlooked when just reading it normally. It's with additional update information after the video is over. It's becoming more and more familiar these days. Again, there will be something called the Hao Miyazaki chronology, so please look forward to it. So, here is the start of the free video. We will talk about Hao Miyazaki's original works that did not make it into Ghibli anime. That is Shuna's Journey. It's a picture story by Hao Miyazaki, an image bunko. It was published in June 1983 and it has 148 pages in total, and when you look at it, it's really an all-color story. It's a story that's somewhere between an all-color picture story and a manga. When I was still a kid, there was a time when shounen magazines were monthly. There were also quite a few monthly magazines, so it was about half and half manga and half stories. So I am used to this kind of format, but I think it is a format that people today cannot get used to. 180 pages of text, or rather, 148 pages of pictures and text, but usually a single comic book is about 180 pages. So I think it's too thin to be considered a book of comic books. Well, it is too thick for an all-color picture book. I heard that it is often sold on the 100 yen shelf at Book Off, and I will talk about why it is rated in such a way later. The Postscript in the last part of the afterword, Hao Miyazaki introduces the Tibetan folk tale on which this story is based. The Tibetan folk tale is this one. It's about a prince who became a dog, and it's about a prince in a poor country that didn't have grain in ancient times. He steals wheat seeds from the dragon king. He is turned into a dog. But he is saved by the love of a daughter, and finally brings wheat to Tibet. That is the story. That's why I was attracted to it. I thought it was based on this story. Since the author himself wrote the afterword, we also tend to think that Shuna's journey is a fantasy. I think of it as a fantasy from long ago. But actually, this story is solid science fiction. It is science fiction with a very rigid setting. I will talk about it later, 
but it is also the original story of Nausicaa. Actually, it was published after the serialization of Nausicaa, so we tend to look at it that way, but as I will explain later, it was written before Nausicaa. It is the original story of Nausicaa and pretty much the origin of all Miyazaki's other works. First, let's follow the story with a map and time lapse. It's quite a complicated story. I don't know if it's okay if I don't follow the time passage, but it starts out like this, with a spread like this. It says departure, and I am no longer certain when it was. Was it long ago or far in the future? It says there was a little kingdom abandoned by time at the bottom of an old valley, gouged out by glaciers. That's a romantic way to start. The first is a double page spread with only one panel in a row. From there, the frames start to break up. The text says, I wonder why people settled in this land. The wind blowing down from the mountains makes the thin air even thinner, and the sunlight does not warm the valley. The reason why the air is so thin, as we will see later, is that there is not much vegetation in this world. In other words, grains and jungles are monopolized by God's island, and there are few photosynthetic plants in the world as a whole, so there is a chronic lack of plants that can exchange and convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. If I introduce the book at this pace, there are 148 pages, so even if I had more hours, it would not be enough. So I'm going to skip the rest. I don't make every page look big like this. I'm just going to give you a rough idea of what it looks like. First, the first half of the map. This is the first half, the blue arrow, 1.2.3.4.5. That flows is the path of Shuna, the path traveled by the main character, a prince named Shuna. The very first is the valley I just mentioned. There was a prince named Shuna in a poor kingdom on top of a mountain in a world that we don't know is past or future. An old traveler came there, and he said, I was actually a prince too, a prince of a certain country. And I left my country when I was young in search of this grain seed. And finally I will die in this strange city, in Shuna's country. Well, there is grain, but it is Hiwabi, which is a very lean grain like millet or Japanese millet. It is rarely harvested. However, the grain brought by the old former prince was very large and heavy. Shuna thinks that if we had this, the country would be saved. He said, please give me that, and then the old man said, I don't mind giving it to you, but this seed is already dead. In other words, they were already threshed, not the kind of seeds that sprout if you just sow them as they are. It has already been threshed like white rice so you can eat it, but it won't sprout even if you scatter it. But if we could only get this seed rice, we would be able to eat it. If we could only get this seed rice, we would be reborn from the poor kingdom. The king and the elders stopped him, but Shuna set out on a journey to find the seeds. This is one. When you get off the mountain, this whole world has already perished. The earth is endlessly rotting, the earth is hollowed out and water with rust floating in it is pulling there. The stone statues of the giants there are rotting away. It was about a month after we had been traveling in this way. Finally, we find a ship that is stranded in the middle of the desert. I will tell you the identity of this ship later. Inside the ship lived a man eating demon. So, while fighting against them, they traveled so far that they ran out of food and forgot their purpose. 4. After seeing several ruined villages and passing only Slaver's cars, we finally arrived at the huge capital city. Finally, we arrived at a huge castle. There was an overflow of grain there, but it was all threshed dead seed. What was being sold and bought at the market was mainly slaves buying and selling human beings. This is Thea and her sisters at your age. Thea, the older sister, and her younger sister are being sold into slavery, and Shuna, out of a sense of justice, tries to help them. But they had spent all their jewelry and other things in the trade to get food, and now they are penniless.
he gets kicked out of town. How is Thea sold to this slave market? Thea's route is indicated by this red arrow. Thea was originally in some distant village, but was sold to a slave trader. Then, she was brought to this castle. What was sold in exchange for what, you see, in this town? A large amount of grain, that big wheat, barley, or oats that Shuna adores. It's wheat grains, and various villages are buying them. So many different villages are buying. After all, they can't eat it. There is almost no edible grain in the world. So the only way to survive in this world is to sell people to buy grain. That is why Thea's sisters were sold and came here. If they had not been rescued by Shuna, they would have been kidnapped by the flying saucer that would appear later and taken to God's land with the other slaves here. The story returns to Shuna. So Shuna gets kicked out of town and meets a mysterious old man. While staying in the wild, the mysterious old man appeared to him and said, There is a land of God far to the west. There is the land of God. He tells Shuna that there is a land of Shinjin, which means man of God, and that there is a golden meadow of grain there. So they kill all the slavers and rescue Thea and her sister. So we remove the chain that is attached to the neck. But, what's more, the pursuers come after us, and we finally end up here, at the end of the west. They run to the cliff where the earth ends. So Shuna and the others let Thea escape to the north. Thea was told, quickly, you must escape at least. They finally let Thea and the others escape to a village in the north of here. It is at the cliff where the ground ends. Shuna witnesses a huge disc. The flip is added to this side at the end. It is a merger. This is where the ground ends. So he witnesses a huge flying saucer. The saucer goes to the western sky, and you can see a glimpse of the other side of the sky at the western end of it. Is the golden grain over there? That is the question, isn't it? After missing Thea, Shuna descended this endless cliff for a long night and then went to the sea. After one night, the sea becomes shallow and they can cross to the other side of the river. At last we landed on the island of Sinjin and other gods people, and it's a paradise with an amazing abundance of both plants and animals. There were giants there. They don't speak a word, and they are just tending to the golden plants. There is a structure like this in the center of the island. There is this structure, and when this glowing moon flies up to the top of it, a strange thing happens. Slaves brought from the outside world drop into the structure from above. Then something starts to change inside this thing. And it turns out that this building is alive. If a Shuna sneaks in, the building is obviously a living organism. Humans come out of it transformed into a glowing liquid, which becomes fertilizer. In addition, these green giants are gradually born from that glowing water, and they slowly emerge from the liquid. The giants spew out golden seeds from their mouths, and this was the seed rice. That grows in just one day. So Shuna finally steals this golden seed. As she is stealing it, she hears a cry in her head telling her to stop but he jumps into the raging sea and escapes. This is about two-thirds of the way through the previous story. Thea, on the other hand, is what I just told you about. She ran away and lived with her sisters to a poor village in the north. There they lived with a mean but kind old lady. One day, Thea felt a presence and helped Shuna who had become like a ghost wandering around the outskirts of the village. So Shuna has lost her speech and her memory. I don't know how many months have passed or if it has been a year or so. Thea and her sister nursed Shuna. Shuna found golden grain seeds in a bag she was carrying around her neck. Thea was so impressed that she sprinkled it over a small field on top of a mountain that she secretly built. 
As she was growing these seeds, they finally sprouted. But just as the seeds were sprouting, Thea was sent off to be married. The mean old lady who had raised her said, You're going to have to get married soon. I imagine her voice like Dora San of Dora's gang in La Puta, without my permission. The grandmother said, You must go and get married. You will take the most powerful young man in the village as your husband. I will use him to make my fields bigger. I don't have such a line, but I made it up as I went along. There is almost no dialogue in this story, just the storyline. Thea is forced to marry. Thea is a beautiful woman. The old woman dresses her in the clothes of her youth. The outfit was already perfect for Thea. Well, Miyazaki's story is a typical one, where a strong old woman comes out, and she used to be a very beautiful girl. Thea will probably become such a scary old woman when she gets old, and this has been a recurring theme since then. In order to marry Thea, an examination is held in the village. All the young men in the village did not pass that examination. Only Shuna passed the test, and Thea and Shuna work as a couple without incident. And then there is the secret wheat field on top of the mountain. Gradually, the harvest grew bigger and bigger, and finally the fruit came in. And with the excitement of the harvest, Shuna regained her memory and language. At first glance, it seems like a happy-go-lucky situation. However, the flying saucer is still flying around in the sky. The army of man-hunters attacked the village, and both Shuna and Thea fought to protect it. After years of this in the sky, when the wheat finally grew enough, the Shunas left half of their crop to the village. The Shunas left half of the crop to the village and said, Now you will not starve. He told them that they would no longer have to fight the man-hunters or sell their children to the slavers when they came. And so begins the long journey back to his home kingdom. The difficulties will still continue. It is a strange story, isn't it? So it seems like a folk tale or an old story, and many people thought it was Tales from Earthsea. The Tales from Earthsea was originally based on this Shuna's journey, according to the official statement. However, if you look at it carefully, this world is a very stiff science fiction. Let's take a look at the economic sphere. After the two spreads that follow, this is the best scenery. After this, the panels are broken up to make a cartoon, but even after planting Hawabi'i seedlings, only a little grass grows from the thin earth. Yakulu are always starving and don't want to have children. These animals called Yakulu do not try to have children. I guess Hiwabi is like millet or millet grain. It was at the end of the Pacific War. Japanese people couldn't eat rice and ate millet or millet as a synonym for poor diet, so I think that's what they are talking about. The farming tools in the second panel. This is how they plant the seeds, Hiwabi. On top of this, you can see the slightly bulging area. You plant the seed roughly on top of the soil. I dig a hole about 3 or 4 centimeters deep in the soil and sow the seeds there. Anyway, the head of the god of spells is attached to the seeds to wish that they will be as fruitful as possible. The Hakulu don't grow grain. Anyway, there is no grass so they can't cultivate the land. So the land that cannot be expanded remains thin. A vicious circle. When we manage to cultivate the land with farming tools, nitrogen enters the land. In normal land, if you plow the land, the nutrients increase rapidly. However, Yakulu is always starving because there is not much grass, so the land cannot be cultivated much, which is a vicious cycle. So people work and die until they rot away. This is the frame where they die, but they carry a white cloth wrapped around them. They carry a white banner up the slope. In other words, what they are carrying is a corpse. It is a funeral. It's a place where they do bird burial, where they dump the dead body directly on the mountain and feed it to the birds. We can grow our own skinny grains like that Hiwabi'i. But wheat and barley, with their high nutritional value, we have to get them as dead seed from human buyers. That is why poor villages they sell human beings as slaves. They live by purchasing grain in that way instead. 
but even if they want to grow their own, all the seeds are dead. They can eat them, but they don't increase even if they are sown. So you are in trouble. By the way, when you go to that example city, there is grain in the storefront. After numerous piles of grain, Shuna's eyes were glued to one pile. The seed he was looking for was there. But they were all threshed and turned into dead seed. This is a modern day analogy. It is the same as GMOs. It was a long time ago. There was a time when I appeared on an information program in the Kansai region. There, a company called Monsanto was in the news because it was about to be acquired by another company, and they featured it. Monsanto was the world's largest grain company at the time. It was a company that sold seedlings, fertilizers, and pesticides for all kinds of crops to farmers. They were notorious for their highly toxic pesticides, which were even used as weapons in the Vietnam War. The seeds they sell are known as devil's seeds, or devil's seeds. The reason why they are called devil's seeds is because of the terminator seeds that Monsanto is developing. Seeds with the terminator gene, seeds with this gene in them, if you grow a fruit and scatter it in the field, it will not germinate. In other words, they only grow for one generation. Farmers have no choice but to buy seeds from Monsanto year after year. So, to tell the truth, they can buy the seeds, scatter them, and when they bear fruit, they can use some of the best ones as seed rice for the next year, but they cannot do that. Monsanto was trying to sell a genetically engineered product with a terminator gene that would only grow for one generation, but this fact can be found out by doing some research. I also knew about this. Monsanto was mentioned in the program that day. Why is the acquisition of Monsanto such news? It is absolutely because this issue has already come to light. Most of the world's agriculture is monopolized by Monsanto. I was going to answer that question during the program. However, the producer came to me at the meeting. He asked me, Okada-san, you know about Monsanto, don't you? The producer did not confirm what I knew. He told me, never talk about it today. He told me, today, if you are asked, please answer only what you are asked. In other words, the Monsanto Terminator gene, or rather, the problem that Monsanto has, is a huge taboo that is not even reported on Japanese TV today. Monsanto is not a sponsor or anything. But even Japanese commercial TV programs go out of their way to control the speech of the actors. I thought it was taboo. Monsanto has now been merged into Bayer AG of Germany. Back to the story. Shuna's country is poor because he cannot buy ordinary grain from the merchants. That's why this country is poor. It was a frontier country that could not even buy this Terminator grain. The country was too far away and no slave traders came. That is why Shuna lived peacefully in a village in the countryside of the north without knowing about the buying and selling of slaves. Pirshna. So he amazed at how this world came to be. What a surprise. The main commodity traded in this town is human beings. He is still innocent and shocked. In this world, ordinary villages and countries sell people and buy Terminator seeds instead. There are countries that do not like to sell people, just like in Shuna's country, so there are armed groups called people hunters. So they capture people and sell them to slavers. The sold people become slaves and are exchanged for food at trading points such as this capital. Flying saucers in the story as well. This roughly explains the economic structure of this world, though. It was then that a pale light, as if a hundred moons had gathered, enveloped Shuna. It was a huge shining face. The moon passed through the sky at great speed. Food is brought from God's land by these flying saucers. 
it is the same flying saucer that brings slaves to God's land. In other words, this flying saucer carries slaves to God's land, and in return, it brings grain. It is a trading ship that brings grain to God's land. The flying saucers purchase slaves and put them into their own giant conversion equipment. This is also as I explained earlier. It is right there in the middle of the room. That huge mass swallows up more and more human beings who start shaking their bodies gently when they are completely swallowed. So the converter remakes humans into fertilizer and giants, and this building-like thing is actually a living organism, made with bioengineering that is far more advanced than ours, just like that flying saucer. From there, the giants are born. This is a huge building. When the Shuna enters this huge building, it finds that it is alive inside, and it is rattling and shaking in a panic to get out of there, though. I guess it's like the source of the image of the giant god warrior in Nausicaa. What happens when you pour a human being into it, you see? In the darkness, slowly this green giant rises up and spews out golden seeds from its mouth. Shuna did not know if the people who were swallowed were reborn as giants or if they were turned into water that moistened them. The giants shimmer and spread out over the field and began to sow yellow seeds from their mouths. These giants spit out seeds from their mouths and spend their whole lives only tending to their grains. So these giants are created life forms as well. So the seeds grow in just a day or so. It is like this, isn't it? It is also a place where tremendous bioengineering and genetic engineering have been developed. There is a notation that the Shuna crossed a shoal, an ocean, along the way. He is saying that there were many species that were supposed to have already perished in that sea. I think that these supposedly extinct species are artificial life forms that have been regenerated through genetic engineering or some other means. Let's take a look at the economic sphere of Shuna's journey so far. Let me give you a quick summary. First of all, people in this man's world are not given large grain seeds. So they are forced into a poor situation where they have no choice but to grow grains that are not very fruitful on really barren land. The reason why they are not given seeds is because of the giants who live beyond the sea. It is because of the Sinjin, and other gods. But the giants are also like mysterious robots made from human beings, and both the grain seeds and the giants are made from human beings. And the moon, or flying saucer, that is used to transport grain instead of humans? It looks like an automatic operation, doesn't it? And who are the people who created the saucers and giants by genetic manipulation? Who are the creators of these mysterious biological machines? The disks and the conversion device building I mentioned earlier are clearly man-made, but Shuna also says that these are man-made. I can't find the people who made them. It is a mysterious world domination that took so much time and effort in the first place. What is the purpose of world domination? That's pretty good, isn't it? It's a good movie, and it's going to be a live-action series in Hollywood. If it were made into a live-action TV series, it would definitely be a big hit. First of all, it has spectacular natural scenery, and there are no huge cities or dragons like in Game of Thrones, so the production cost can be kept relatively low. Maybe a new character from Shuna's country, or Thea's hometown. If you add people who oppose the trip, you can expand the storyline. I can expand the storyline. Also, there could be a woman who is a cannibal demon or their organization. Also, you can add as many characters as you want, such as a man hunter or a slave trader. So chapters 1 through 4 are 60 minutes each, and the climax of chapters 5 and 6 are longer. 
so they are divided into four episodes of 60 minutes each for a total of eight episodes for a TV series. Netflix is a good choice, because if you spend a billion dollars to make one episode, you will get your money's worth. Please think about it for a minute. I don't know how to say it here, but really, this is really a good story for a drama series that is being played overseas. This is a story that would be perfect as an original story for a drama that is probably being played overseas right now. Let's go back to the story. The biggest mystery in this world is who created this world? This is properly in this story, isn't it? It's a giant life machine that turns humans into giants. Also, the technology that makes flying saucers. It's a strange world where there are guns and the only means of transportation is horse-drawn carriages, and it's a trade that strategically uses Terminator grains like Monsanto. But the real mastermind behind all this is on the surface, he does not appear in the story. However, in the first battle scene of the story, the ship buried in the desert, which I mentioned earlier, appears. One month after leaving his hometown, Shuna feels the presence of people for the first time. It was a ship made of wood and stone. It was so large that it had probably never sailed and was now rotting away. It is a ship attached to such a desert. Many people say that this is Tales from Earthsea, and they are right. There's a scene in Tales from Earthsea, where Heitaka is looking at the remains of a huge ship in the exact same composition. He says that they are the remains of a dried up sea. In Tales from Earthsea, this is actually a real ship. The sea level itself has receded and they are left on land. It is a wooden ship. It says that it was a boat made of stone and wood, but why did it have to be made of stone? I thought they were just repairing the buried or broken parts. But as you can see from the rather close up here, they are not repairing the broken parts of wood with stone. If you look closely, you will see that the stone is the base. The stone is in the back and the wood is stretched over the surface. In other words, the wood is used to fix the part of the stone that has collapsed. The stones are not piled on top of the broken parts of the wooden boat. It is the opposite. A woman appears here, and behind her is also a pile of stones. When Shuna is invited to enter the room, she finds that all the rooms inside are also made of stone. In other words, the inside of the boat is basically made of stone with only wood used to repair the broken parts. It is useless to build a ship made of stone like this. They don't float on water. I'm just wondering if it really is a boat in the first place. Let's take a closer look at this desert area. Let's start from the top panel, please. If you look closely, you will see a forest of masts at the top. There are a lot of them. This is not the way to do it. You can't run on the sea. If you put up a lot of masts just because you build a big ship, and ask if it can catch the wind and run, it can't run. These masts are not for attaching sails. We have already seen something similar to this. This is from that castle in the sky. It is the ship that flies in the sky in the opening. It is the same type of ship, isn't it? The mast is actually the shaft of a propeller and there are several double reversing propellers attached to it that rotate and fly in the sky. It is actually anti-gravity. It is anti-gravity, but even in the lore, everyone assumes it is a propeller. That's how the opening is. Well, it is the same type of ship. The reason why the ship is made of stone is also the same. In Laputa, the early airships were made of wood, isn't it? It's made of stone at the stage where you can move the castle. Laputa which Pazu and his friends snuck into, was also made of stone, wasn't it? So, with Laputa's gravity control technology, there is no need to use lighter materials at all. It is because it is possible to obtain the same amount of repulsive force, or anti-gravity, as the mass of the material it holds. 
The aristocracy lived in stone houses from ancient times. European society had a culture in which the nobility lived in stone houses and the poor lived in wooden houses. The reason for this is that stone houses were the Norman Roman times, but gradually the technique of masonry was lost. But the nobles still live in stone houses and the poor live in wooden houses, so the idea is that the nobles live in stone houses. So, actually, Shuna's journey is a story after Laputa crashed, and it is a story about the period connecting Laputa and Nausicaa. The world has not been completely destroyed like in Nausicaa, and there is still agriculture in Nausicaa's world, but the story is about halfway between Laputa and Nausicaa. In this way, you can see that Shuna's journey, which seems to be a fantasy depicting ancient legends, is actually science fiction with a lot of backstory. If you look at it from that perspective, it is a mysterious scene that you have missed until now. I think you should think about it once more. For example, this is a giant made of stone. When Shuna was traveling, there was a giant made of stone. He thought it was a stone statue in the shape of an ancient god, but was it really so? I will explain this later. Why do they face the same direction? There are so many of them. If it might be the giant that destroyed the world, that image is also used in Nausicaa. Then there are the Sinjins. If we were to describe the celestial world of Laputa, where did these Sinjin go to? For example, the Laputa people. So they came down to earth and started farming and became the ancestors of the Thetas. But there is no ancestor or lord of these giants or discs in this world, is there? There is no lord. We come to the man-eating demons of the desert. You are the ghouls, the man-eating demons who live in the desert sea. Why do they live in crashed flying saucers and the wreckage of castles? If they are descendants of the lord originally, why don't they eat wheat? If they really want to eat people, why don't they just buy up slaves in the saucers and eat them themselves? Why do they seem to have originally lived in flying castles? Why do they now repeatedly attack travelers? Why do you draw them as if their eyes are glowing? Miyazaki doesn't answer these questions in his story, but he does answer them in the pictures. It's Hao Miyazaki, but he doesn't answer with stories, but with pictures. So, going forward. I would like to start with films such as Shuna's Journey, which clearly influenced Hao Miyazaki at the time, and other works from the same period that influenced Miyazaki in his youth. I'll start with the films and novels that influenced Miyazaki in his youth and adolescence. I will try to find out this mystery. Thank you for your time. That's it for today's free video. I have some upgrade information, but here you go. Hao Miyazaki Chronology. This time, we will be looking at Hao's unfortunate times. In 1979, when he was 38 years old, I released Cagliostro's Castle, which didn't get any audience at all. Lupin 3, Castle of Cagliostro is appreciated now, but Hao Miyazaki was expelled from the animation industry. After that, it was 1980. The Lupin 3 series called Saraba Aishiki Lupin, Wings of Death Albatross. This is also the last one. The main staff of Lupin 3 didn't like me anymore. There were a lot of people who followed and appreciated Hao Miyazaki, but it was a time when the animation industry had become a bit estranged from him. Then, in 1980, when he was 41 years old, it's called Little Nemo in Dreamland, a Japan-US co-production. Well, it was a blockbuster. It was produced by a Star Wars producer named Gary Kurtz. But it didn't work out. I got fed up and left Telecom, the company I started with. This is the point, isn't it? The publication of Shuna's Journey is a work that he managed to publish when he was 42 years old and everything was going wrong. That was before Nausicaa. So, Shuna's Journey is in a special position. It still retains Hao Miyazaki's gloomy side, or rather, the depression of his sullen youth as if it were still undiluted. It is a story that he made because he felt he had to tell this story to children, despite his resentment toward the world. It is a very heavy story to tell to children. But I told it, and that is the story of Shuna's journey.
This is after Shuna's journey. When Hayao Miyazaki started the Nausicaa series, the movie was released and became a big hit. Ghibli was established. I think it is a rather valuable work that is a turning point. This year 2022. The journey of Shuna has been translated into English. It has been translated into English. It will be officially announced for the international market. The title is Shuna's Journey as it is. In my previous video, I mentioned that the worldview of Shuna's Journey is so well developed that it would definitely be popular if it were made into a drama series on Netflix or something. I think this prediction may be quite accurate. If it is published abroad and becomes a hit to some extent, I think it will be made into a drama. Well, I don't know if Hao Miyazaki will allow it while he is still alive, but I am very much looking forward to it. Miyazaki makes other people's works as he pleases, but he is very strict about other people doing his own original work. You really should think about what Ursula Kroberlagin did to you. I don't think I should leave the original work to others. Now, the full length version of the video including the limited part that you saw today, is available only to paying members. What kind of story are we talking about in the limited edition, of course, is one more step about Shuna's journey. I'm talking about the source of inspiration for the later Shuna's journey. It introduces three science fiction works that I believe are the source material in Hao Miyazaki's mind. Also, the tales from Earthsea, which is similar to Shuna's journey and is said to be based on it. The film explains what is in Tales from Earthsea that is not in Shuna's journey, and talks about Shuna's unique worldview. To watch the rest of the video, please visit the official Toshio Okada archive, YouTube membership, and Dungo's blog channel. Please choose any of them to join and watch. See you again in the next video. See you soon, bye bye.